So in this lesson, we'll, we'll introduce a technique called caching, which is pervasive in, uh, computer, in, in the design of computer systems. Okay, so as I, I just said, this technique is used in many, many different layers of a computer system, from the very bottom, purely hardware layers, up to completely software-managed and arbitrarily complex applications. In any case, the general goal of caching is always the same. The purpose is to improve the performance of a computer program to increase its execution speed. So we, we'll start by casting a very elementary definition of the technique and the problem it tries to address. And later on, we'll try to generalize a little bit uh, the scope of the technique. So we have a running program that needs to access some information. And the information is stored in a memory, which is fairly big, but also fairly slow uh, with respect to the speed of the running program that requests the information. The idea of caching consists in introducing a small additional memory layer, which is much smaller, but significantly faster than the uh, big reference memory we introduced previously. So taking this new cache component into account, we will slightly modify the typical processing flow of a request to retrieve a piece of information. So now, anytime we want to retrieve a piece of data, instead of requesting it directly from the memory, we'll first issue a request to the cache, just in case, to see if the cache holds a copy of the item we're looking for. And if we're lucky, we have what is called a cache it, and we get an immediate reply, and so we have saved a lot of time compared to the slow pass with the complete memory. If we are unlucky, when we will contact the cache, we will not find the item we're looking for, in which case we have what is called a miss, and so we will have to carry on and retrieve the information from the memory. On the way back, before we return the requested information to the program, we will store a copy of the information in the cache in the hope that it will be useful next time we request it and so that we can avoid another trip to the slow uh, memory. Note that in order for this technique to be efficient, the interaction with the cache, querying the cache and filling it in with information should be uh, something that is achieved very quickly so that these interactions with the cache are negligible with respect to the amount of time we spend interacting with the slow memory. So now the question is, why does, does caching usually work very well in practice? And actually, this is due to a property that we can observe empirically. So we take a lot of very different programs, and when we run them, they have something in common, which is a phenomenon that we call the locality principle. And to be more precise, there are two forms of locality. The first one is temporal locality, and the second one is spatial locality. And we'll discuss both of them, and we'll start with the temporal locality. So the notion of temporal locality is the following. Again, it's an observation derived from uh, the execution of concrete programs. What we observe in practice is that a program that has accessed a given information, piece of information in the recent past, is very likely to access the same piece of information again in the near future. And for example, in many programs, we have loops like for or while programming constructs. When we program with loops, there is a body and within the, bo the body of the loop will be executed several times consecutively. When we run a loop, each time we run another iteration of a loop, the same instruction will be executed once more. In the same way, the instructions that make the body of a loop manipulate a set of variables. And so every time we execute the loop, the same variables will be executed once more. Now let's discuss the notion of special locality. A program that has accessed a piece of information in the recent past is very likely in the near future to access 
other pieces of information that are close to the first one. And here we need to elaborate a little bit on notion of proximity, of being close to the previous uh, piece of information. So in the most basic setup, if we have different data items that are placed next to each other in memory, this simply means that if we have tried to access some data stored at address i, then it's very likely in the near future that we will try to access the data item stored at a surrounding address, either a superior address or and or an inferior address. A higher abstraction level, this could mean, for instance, let, let's suppose that we download a web page and the web page has references to a set of images. So if we don't know this web page, it's very likely that in the near future, we will also attempt to download the images that are referenced by this web page. So this notion of proximity, of spatial proximity, depends on the abstraction level that we consider. But essentially, this means that there are some connections between different pieces of information, and when we start to access one, it's very likely that we will access the other ones as well in the very near future. Let's continue with an, another illustration of this, the phenomenon of spatial locality. When you execute a piece of code, by default, where there are no loops, we will execute an instruction, and then we will jump to the next instruction and so on. And this instruction, when they are executed sequentially by default, this means that they are placed next to each other in memory. Another example regarding data and spatial locality is what happens when you get a loop that iterates over the elements of an array. So here we see that every time we execute an iteration of the loop, we will uh, try to access the next item, the next slot within the array name T. So that's another illustration of special locality. So to leverage special lo locality in addition to temporal locality, we can slightly modify the basic approach that we had before. So when we get a request for item X and we get a cache miss, so we don't find information in the cache, so we have to go to the slow memory to request it. Instead of simply requesting and fetching this precise item, what we can do is that we can try to amortize this long latency to query the memory to also fetch the surrounding items so that we'll not only bring back X, but also these other items in order to increase the likeliness that we'll find the next requested items directly in the cache. Now to make things more concrete, we'll give two examples of caches found in a computer system. The first example is what we can find at the level of a CPU, so down at the hardware level. So the CPU is going very fast and is working on a set of very fast memories called registers, but these registers have a very limited capacity. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the main memory, the RAM, which is plentiful but it's very slow compared to the CPU processing speed. So in order to avoid having the CPU spend most of its time waiting for the RAM, what we do in modern chips is that we introduce a set of caches. Actually, on modern CPUs, there is not just one level of cache, but there are several levels, uh, typically two or three. So we have a L1 level one cache, which is very small, but very fast, only slightly slower than the CPU's uh, speed. Then we have L2 cache, which is bigger, but slower. And then uh, L3 cache, which is even bigger, but uh, slower. The second example is the cache managed at the application level. So completely at the software level uh, within a web browser. So let's assume that you have a web browser and you want to download an image stored on a web server. So the browser will issue a request over the internet to contact the web server and the web server will reply with the requested file. Before displaying the image on the screen, the web browser application will actually save a copy of the file on the local disk 
in the hope that if the same user requests the same image once again in the future, it can avoid a long round trip over the network and instead get a local copy. Now we'll try to extend the basic notions that we've seen so far with another example. And for this example, we'll consider the case of a search engine such, a, such as the ones that we use on a daily basis on, on the web. When we use a search engine, we provide as input a set of keywords. What the search engine does in the background is that it will fetch the first keyword and then use it to query an index to retrieve a set of uh, web pages that contain this keyword. And then it will do the same for all the other keywords. Eventually, it will compute the intersection of all these different sets of pages to find the pages that contain all these keywords. And finally, it will apply some algorithm to sort all these different pages according to some criteria of relevance. So this is quite a long and complex task. So typically what the search engine will do is it will not just send a reply to the user, but it will also keep a copy of the computed results because it's very likely that, first of all, the same user may request the same query again in the future. And if the topic happens to be popular, then it's also very likely that other users will issue the same request in the near future. So it makes sense if the result can be deterministically computed, like it's the case for this for a search engine service, it makes a lot of sense to keep a copy of the result to avoid recomputing it every time. As a summary of this example, we can notice two differences compared to the previous examples. The first one is that the caching technique cannot just be applied to retrieve some information faster, information that was stored in some storage system, but it can also actually be applied to save and avoid recomputing results. Second difference and extension compared to the introduction is that caching technique can be useful not only for a single user, single program that repeat, repeatedly issues the same requests, but caching a given result can potentially be benefit uh, to many different programs, clients, users. So as a summary, the caching technique is a very simple and efficient approach to improve the execution speed of most programs in, computer, in computing. Yet the implementation details of a cache are not as straightforward as it may seem. And we'll spend a few minutes giving a, a very quick overview of some implementation concerns that one has to take into account when designing a cache. So a cache consists in a set of slots in which we can store pieces of information. The first question is placement of the items within the cache. For maximum flexibility, it would be good to allow any item to be stored in any slot of the cache. Yet, having such a freedom implies that when we need to query the cache, we need to check all the different items to determine whether the item is found in the cache or not. This can potentially slow down the step of querying the cache and this can be a problem because if we spend too much time doing this, then the cache may become inefficient. This is especially problematic for the caches that are expected to be very fast, such as the ones which are integrated within the CPUs. A second important question about the design of a cache is the replacement policy. By definition, a cache is a small memory, a small capacity, so it will very soon become completely full. And the next time we need to store an item within the cache, we'll need to choose an existing item so that we will evict this old item to make room for the new one. But the decision about which item to be evicted must be made with care, because otherwise, if the item that we have chosen for eviction turns out to be very used very frequently, then this will be counterproductive because we will 
uh, very soon need to query again the slow memory to bring back the evicted item. A third important question is related to the management of updates. The programs usually do not only need to read information but also to modify and update this information. As a consequence, uh, we must ask ourselves what should we do when the program modifies a piece of information. Should we store the update in the cache? And if so, should we immediately propagate the update to the mem to a slow memory or not? Okay. A second related question is what to do if another machine modifies the value of the item? How should we notify the different caches so that they don't get stuck with an outdated copy of the item? Finally, an important question is how to properly dimension the capacity of the cache. We have to find a reasonable trade-off. If the cache is too small, it will not be efficient enough. We will have lots of misses. And if the cache is too big, we will have a waste of resources.